Now, here on this week, we pretty much say what we like. Not that anybody takes much notice, which given the level of drivel that's spewed out every week is probably just as well. But these days, some folks are frightened to say anything. They worry that they'll use the wrong words, offend people they didn't mean to offend, set off a Twitter mob, or worse, against them. In a world where so-called safe spaces are spreading, virtue signaling is rife, and there's an epidemic of hashtag me too's, when even Jerry Seinfeld has stopped doing his stand-up routine at American universities because the students are too politically correct, are we now in the grip of a new Puritanism? In these difficult times, we turn for guidance to someone who's the epitome of balance, moderation, consideration, courtesy, civility, and charm. Yes, it's historian David Starkey. <laughs> this is his take of the week. The British political system of monarch, lords and commons is now almost 800 years old. It survived because behind the fixed facade of parliament, it's proved astonishingly adaptable to changing social realities. In continental Europe, the ancien regime had to be torn down by revolution. In Britain, change came by evolution as first the bourgeoisie, then the working class, and finally women secured a vote for and representation in Parliament. Our parliamentary constitution even survived the rise of the Labour Party, as the monarchy under George V and the Tory party under Stanley Baldwin went out of their way to welcome Labour ministers and trade unionists alike into the corridors of power and Buckingham Palace itself. This is the world portrayed brilliantly in the film Darkest Hour. But everything in that world, the patriotism, the shared values, the importance of rhetoric is now as dead and buried as Winston Churchill himself. For, in the last 20 years, we've had a revolution by stealth. Not in our streets, but in our values, as a generation brought up with no rules and no religion has lurched with quasi-religious fervour into a puritanical groupthink where debate is stifled and difference of opinion cannot be tolerated. Everywhere is back to the Middle Ages. In the universities, no platforming is a heresy trial without the stake. In law, the uncovering of historic sex abuse has turned from due process into a witch craze. Accusation proves guilt. Every victim must be believed. This is Salem. In politics, too, there's a new pseudo-religious intensity. Pro-Trump and anti-Trump, Remainer and Brexiteer confront each other in a sort of holy war, while in the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, JC, plays the Messiah, and momentum presents itself as a cross between the Jesuits and the Knights Templar. This does not bode well. The last time that religion so dominated politics was in the Puritan Revolution, which led to civil war, the abolition of parliament and military dictatorship. Welcome to the Millennials Millennium. And thanks to Western London and Shoreditch for putting up with the This Week Antiquities. Welcome, David Starkey. Back to the programme. So, Liz, are we in the group of a puritanical groupthink which doesn't tolerate difference, or is that just the shadow cabinet? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there is now a kind of, sort of moral or religious fervour about a lot of the different positions, whether, you know, particularly around Brexit, and in the end, I don't think that you 
win arguments by just shouting louder and louder. You have to try and understand. I mean, you're never going to, you know, I'm never going to convince uh, Nigel Farage that uh, Brexit is wrong. But the reason that you engage in debates is to try and persuade the undecided, to try and understand where people are coming from, rather than just shouting people down or no platforming them. Michael? Well, I, I thought David was probably exaggerating. I mean, surely the, um, the divisions over Brexit can be compared with the divisions over appeasement. Uh, they can be compared with the divisions over the reform of the House of Lords um, just before the First World War, or indeed the divisions over Ireland just before the First World War. So I think we've been here again and again. Uh, you know, I think there are some dangers, but I think David takes you know, a kernel of an interesting idea uh, but blows it up. Of the things that he mentioned, I think the one that has bothered me the most is the idea that if you accuse someone, their name can be plastered over the newspapers, they can be, uh, they can be arrested, uh, they can be put on bail for a very long period of time, it takes a very long time to resolve the case, and it is as though that person had been found guilty, because in the year or two that that takes, their name has been sullied all over the press and the media. Let's take the first bit for the new Puritanism come on to the sex abuse accusations <coughs> later. Michael says you're exaggerating. That we've had this kind of coarse discourse before. He's right in one sense, in all of the instances that he mentioned. What I think is new now is the depth of this phenomenon. Uh, in other words, appeasement, uh, the Irish question and so on, weren't underpinned by new structures. We've now got new structures in the internet which prioritise extremes. The fact that you've got opinion expressed anonymously. This is the most dangerous of things. The, the, re, the whole internet seems to me to be founded on a complete misapprehension of human behaviour. It's founded on the notion human beings are good. Whereas if we're allowed to behave badly and get away with it, you and I know we do. Uh, uh, we do. Hold and on. This, uh, it's true. There Come people, on. There are people watching. Uh, there, uh, I, I, hope one, I hope one or two. I hope one or two. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but sorry, well, they won't the, be but, unless you get to the point. Well, I think I have, I have got to the point that, w that where, Michael is, where Michael is wrong, is that there are new structures that are underpinning this. Um, okay. And this seems to me to be profoundly important, and I think it's undercutting politics as we know it. Um, this programme is nice and civilised people watch it, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the fundamentals of what are going on outside. Liz has made the point when she said, we want reason debate. There is no reason debate. Oh. Reason debate has died in public. Let me bring Miranda in here. What, what did you make of what Michael had to say about the, the sex abuse, the sex harassment claims? Mm. That that's, in a, in a way, I think what Michael was saying was has gone too far. Well, I think it's always difficult to know which is the movement and which is the backlash, because then you get a backlash against the backlash. And actually, I think we're just having a huge cultural discussion, mm -hmm. taking sides, some people changing their minds. And I don't know where we'll end up, but I think it will be a different place from before the Weinstein scandal and before and the Me Too movement, place. and probably a better place. So that's much to be applauded. No, revolution, what I think, revolutions no, no. on the whole lead to worse. The, the history it's not of, a revolution. It's a moral revolution. It's not a well, revolution. It is, you're it's wrong. Not a revolution. It's a moral revolution. No, where I would agree recognize... with you, where I would agree with you, David, is that I do think that there is a sort of obligation on people at the moment to kind of express moral yes, certainty exactly right. about yes. an issue rather than debate it. And I think that is damaging to the quality of our kind of, of, kind of national so discourse. So can we just be clear, and there really has been a moral revolution. I mean, I'm gay, uh, it's now practically compulsory. Forty years ago... No, seriously, let's, no, let's look at these things. Is that the secret things. about me you were trying to tell the audience? <laughs> With your scarf, darling, and the hanky, I wonder. But... Um, <laughs> You know you too blush. much. You blush. You blush. I see you this uh, civilised discussion and, is going and, well. And, 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 and Molly the dog as well. You know. Uh, you but, keep no, Molly seriously, out of it. there has been a complete revolution of values between the sexes. In I mean, look again at the whole business of transgendering. The the unmentionable has become enforceable. 
there's been genuine inversions of moral, in, in our lifetimes, your lifetime and mine, because we're ancient, moral values have inverted. Yeah, well, I, I, th I think it is true that moral values have been inverted, but I don't think the process has come to an end. Well, in other words, a, in what's, other words, what's a moral value that's been inverted? The, the one that he referred to, our, Which one? Our, our view of homosexuality, for example. That, that, that has changed completely. I mean, David But that, isn't that a plus? Well, we're not... Uh, well, I think it is a plus, but I would also say that I think it leads us to, uh, it should lead us to believe that no moral position is absolute or even to be relied upon for any period of time. We are, moral positions are changing nowadays like fashions, mm. constantly changing. Uh, you're you're, I mean, you're it's, grimacing it's, this. No, this, this, case, this case of Max Mosley this week is quite interesting because uh, Max Mosley uh, apparently was the uh, agent for a leaflet that was published in 1961. In 1961, the racism that was um, addressed in the leaflet was not illegal, but homosexuality was. I mean, that is just an example of how in just 50 years uh, the, the world has turned absolutely upside down. I'm still struggling to see the bad news in this if the kind of racism in that leaflet is no longer acceptable and homosexuality is No, we're just, saying it's, been a we're just saying it's been a revolution. You seem if to think it been... hasn't been a good thing. And in many what? ways, it's been a, a hugely are... welcome one. But... I would really like to have grown up not being groped when I was a waitress and being told by the boss, just get back out there and serve them. It's you're fussing about nothing. I think it's good if we actually get to the situation where, that that's, where that's not happening no, that, that, Those things are good. I think the, the suspension of due process in law is not good. And even organisations like the BBC are complicit in the suspension of due process by having helicopters hovering over Cliff Richard's house uh, when he's being uh, raided and arrested. So, I mean, th there are things in this which are very, very worrying. But and the non-platforming of people in universities is extremely worrying. Yes. So, I, mean, I, agree with I, I don't think David meant to say that everything in this revolution is bad. I didn't. But, I just but, said it was a revolution. But in things other words, are... revolution just means turning things upside down. Correct. And well, things have been turned upside down. Now, on the attitudes towards sexual harassment and worse, that may not be a revolution, but it is a watershed in attitudes. And perhaps, as in all these things, I mean, to put it bluntly, for years men just got away with this. Yes, they did. And now they don't to the yearly the same extent, being called to account. And in that change, the pendulum and all these things, it sometimes goes a bit too far the other way. And Bob talks about the lack of due process. But at some stage, it will settle down somewhere and it will be a better place it settles down. I think that's true. I think part of what David is warning about, if I understand him correctly, is, about, is, is against a, a change that would resemble something that they have in America, where you actually end up dividing people and you end up with culture wars about these sorts of issues. Policy. We have. And and we well, I don't, I don't, have think, I don't think we have we it have quite yet. I, yeah. I think, I, like Michael, I think it's a slightly overstated case and I think we can actually move on on this Sorry, issue and others with actually, with, and avoid with, America's culture wars. Because if you're too certain that things changing, uh, that, that, that the fact that things are changing is bad, no, then you're actually taking a position but, in a culture war, you know, David, and you're sort of starting one of your own. I'm not saying that at all. But the, some of the, the American identity wars, uh, uh, um, wars have come here. They have I mean, you're an academic. Come here. I mean, is They've it really completely. true that student, a lot of students now, and this will give you the final word on this, that they don't want to be exposed to opinions that trouble them or with which they don't agree? Yes, I think it is absolutely true. We're also getting a determination to rewrite the historical past. We're getting a shyness about any form of genuine national identity. And one of the things that I worry about most is without a clear notion of a national identity and a national story, there's no possibility of genuine democratic political action. Political action depends on the fact we all recognise certain things in common with each other. If we're to be divided into tribes, if we're to be divided into genders, if we're to be divided into races, then I'm afraid there's only one form of government that can hold the balance. And it is somebody who sits in a throne like you and exercises <laughs> imperial <laughs> authority, I'm which you do <laughs> so well. I'm beginning to know <laughs> Thanks for being here. Good to see you. Emolient as ever.